Eagle Forum is also very proud of Marshall, uh, Steve Marshall's actions as AG because he has recently joined with other states to boldly and directly fight back against the federal government's overreach. These are just some of the things that he's done. He's challenging the unbridled regulations of the EPA, the, new green, uh, the green New Deal, cancellation of the Keystone Pipeline, and rejecting the schemes to pack the Supreme Court. He's filed lawsuits to protect the unborn and religious liberty and to also prevent the long-failed Equal Rights Amendment to be illegally added to the U.S. Constitution. Steve Marshall is a man of deep faith and an impeccable reputation, and it is my honor to welcome you today. Thank you, Becky. That's the first introduction of the person to introduce your speaker, so <laughs> thank you for that. Y'all, I would, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the remarkable work that Becky has done in the legislature this year. Not only has it been a difficult building to enter, but it's also been incredibly hard to shine light on the things that have been going on there. And I see Arnold and Dan here, grateful for your presence. Wish your colleague shared, yes. Some of the same things, but Becky, thank you for your hard work. It has not gone unnoticed. Well, y'all, it's a privilege to be here and an opportunity to be able to introduce to you a remarkable speaker. And I can tell you, as somebody who's had a chance to read her life history, uh, be prepared to be humbled when you understand where she came from and what she's done. You know, one of the things as a prosecutor you do is try to tell a story about somebody's life. And I want to share with you a little bit of her story. One of 12 children living in a shack with no running water or indoor bathroom sleeping on a kitchen floor and witnessing poverty and daily fighting between her parents. Dr. Carol Swain has fought her way to success. As a shy and broken teenage mother to a divorced McDonald's employee too shy to call out the orders, Carol has risen to become a powerful voice in our country, empowering others to raise their voices in the public square. She's an award-winning political scientist, former professor of political science, and professor of law at Vanderbilt University, an author or an editor of eight books, and she's been cited multiple decisions at our United States Supreme Court. She's published multiple opinion pieces on a variety of issues and is a sought after commentator for broadcast media. And y'all, while knowing her accomplishments that are far too many to name, the only thing that she and I share in common is that we were fellow Tar Heels. <laughs> so I'm gonna take that uh, as something to do. Let me tell you a little bit more about her. One of the things that, that I thought was remarkable is that she attributed much of her success to two individuals that were a part of her life. One was a doctor who, after saving her life, told her she was intelligent and attractive and encouraged her to do more with her life. The second, an orderly that she worked with in a nursing home, prompted her to begin her academic career through college. And from a GED to four advanced degrees, to being a tenured professor to an award-winning author, Carol Swain is a shining example to all of us how you can succeed when you decide to make a difference. Found a remarkable quote from her when she said this, it's an amazing what a little encouragement can do. I believed in the American dream and that I could overcome the circumstances of my birth. Please welcome me, or join me in welcoming our accomplished Christian conservative speaker, Dr. Carol Swain. Thank you so much for that introduction, and um, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, it's good to be among people that you know love you, that understand you, and that you're all on the same page. And Uni, thank you for what you do, and Eagle Forum has been around for a long time, and they've always been on the front lines. And you know, some of the warriors, uh, you know, they're like me, we're becoming advanced uh, age, ages, and we really do need more young people. By young, uh, I consider anyone that's under 60 is young. Uh, we need you out there and your teens and that type of thing. 
And before I actually begin my remarks, I'd like to share this video that was uh, produced by Coral Ridge Ministries, um, I believe in 2012. And uh, it was one of those deals where you sign away all your rights. You don't get to see it until it's finished. <laughs> my mother has never watched it. <laughs> and um, and it, it has reenactments. So if you would uh, watch that and then I'll talk. Thank you. We were the poorest of the poor, and that was a part of the identity. I'm a university professor now, but I never uh, can remember a time growing up that I ever said, I want to be a university professor. I was born and raised in the rural South, and I was one of 12 children. I was second from the oldest. We lived in extreme poverty. The early part of my life, we lived in a two-room shack, and it was literally a shack. It's so tiny. And my elder sister and I and some of the younger, the children that were the first kids, we slept on the kitchen floor. The house did not have any running water or indoor plumbing, and not having a bathroom in the house, and so really having with the older people call a slop jar in the house and having to empty that. Uh, those are things that made it very difficult. You had to put a pot on the stove and heat up the, the water to bathe in. And all of us bathed from that same cruddy pail of water. And you know, you can imagine by the time it got to the third or fourth kid, it's pretty dirty. And it was not uncommon for us to go into the local dumps looking for whatever we could find. Growing up in that shack, all I can remember is just sadness. It was very depressed. I always felt unloved. There was always conflict in the house. There was never enough of anything. There were fights every Friday when my stepfather got paid there would be a fight between my mother and uh, the stepfather, but these would be really violent fights. The most graphic memory is my stepfather chasing my mother with an ax, threatening to kill her, and the children, we, we were running around, you know, grabbing at his legs, uh, trying to protect our mother. Later, my mother moved to the city when I was probably 12 or 13 and became in involved with uh, social workers and welfare programs. And what I watched happen in my family was that it became a way of life for her and for some of my siblings. And I saw what a trap welfare is. And for many people, and still for some of my siblings, they've never held a steady job. At that time, I was a high school dropout. I had dropped out after completing the eighth grade. I felt shame, I felt, I felt fear, I was depressed. And so I married at 16, not because I was in love, I married a neighbor that was a little bit older just to get away from home. Part of the misery that I experienced in my childhood, some of it just continued into my marriage and into my early life. At some point, uh, I started taking bottles of pills and I really wanted to die. I had the experience of being in the hospital after one of my suicide gestures, having a medical doctor tell me that I was intelligent, that I was attractive, and that kind of shocked me because I was, you know, at least 20, 21, and I'd never heard anyone tell me that I was attractive. He said, you're intelligent, you're attractive, you can do more with your life. I took a job outside the home. I filed for divorce. Everything started to change. And at one of the nursing homes where I was working as a nurse's aide, I met an African orderly from Sierra Leone. He said, you ought to go to college. And those words changed my life. I studied hard. I earned my GED. I worked hard doing whatever I could do to get by and I was able to graduate from a community college 
go on to a four-year college and graduate magna cum laude, and I went on to earn several graduate degrees. Somehow, I always believed that I could do it, that I could better myself, that I was not meant to be poor. I was able to far exceed anything that I imagined for myself or anyone else probably that was watching my life unfold. These milestones, my accomplishments, didn't come easy. It was through hard work, it was perseverance, a can-do spirit that I attribute to the grace of God. It is so amazing what a little encouragement and direction can do. But the system itself doesn't encourage people to better themselves. The social welfare programs that we have in America puts a band-aid on the problem, but it does not fix it. The only thing these programs do is create, in the long term, a sense of entitlement that results in a loss of self-worth for the individual. The truth is, people feel good about themselves when they can work and provide for themselves and for their families. So that's uh, the video that was put together. My mother looks nothing like that stereotypical black woman that <laughs> was in that film. <laughs> and uh, she would not be very happy if she were to see that. And so I think it's best that she doesn't know that this exists. <laughs> and um, I was asked today about, you know, what we can do for people that are in poverty. What was the single most important thing that changed my life? Uh, you know, is it, is it the family and just various things. And of course, if you have a two-parent family where they love you and, you know, if they're Christian, uh, but even if you just have two parents, you're going to have an advantage above other people. That's almost like privilege. And when it comes to all this talk about white privilege, I can tell you that there is black privilege, there's Hispanic privilege, there's Asian privilege. A lot of what we call privilege is really a uh, social class. And I think the most important thing that changed my life was the people that God sent into my life that steered me. I had no intention of becoming a university professor. And I used to be painfully shy, uh, so shy that if someone asked me my name, I would literally forget it, I would freeze up. And I used to write out everything I was going to say. Uh, even as a professor, I tried to write out everything. And if I had to introduce someone, I had to write everything out and, um, and read it. And for you all young people, you may be in a class, young people, in college, and maybe in high school, uh, they have a class participation part of your grade, and it might be 10%. And that 10% matters, you know, maybe between an A and an A minus or an A and a B plus. And I was someone that wanted to do well in school, so I wanted to get the 10%, but I was shy. And what I would do was write out a question or write out a comment, and I would read it. And the paper would be, and my voice would be quivering. And, and that's how I got my 10% class participation. And so you can do it as a shy person, but it's very hard. And, you know, just, it was difficult. But, um, I can say that, uh, again, the mentors that God sent in my life, they did not look like me. And even uh, back then, you had the messages that, uh, that minorities and women needed role models. And the assumption was that the role models had to look like them. And I can tell you that if that were the case, you would never have a first in any field. And so yet we have people that are the first in all sorts of fields. That would not have happened if they had to wait for a role model that looked like them. And um, uh, people have talked about uh, tapestries. And you know, you turn them on the back and they have all these threads and how they're interwoven together. Uh, and, uh, and I think it was 2012, someone came up with the tapestry of life. And I believe it very much, um, co it connects with me because I think about that medical doctor the orderly, the mentors I've had, who I am today. God used all those people in my life and I was not a devout believer until late in life. I had a late conversion experience. And uh, I'm often asked, 
you know, if the doctor knows, you know, what became of me. Well, he didn't until about three years ago. And people would ask, well, did you ever tell the doctor? Well, there were several times, and I, and I um, people say I'm courageous, I'm bold, and all, all of this stuff. Well, I looked that doctor up many years ago, but I, um, I tracked him down. You know, I got the American Medical Association book. He was an intern, and I found out that he was 20. He was 25 when I was 20. So when he told me that he was 25, and I was probably 20, 21, uh, I tracked him down, but I did not have the courage to make the phone call. Some of it had to do with, I was terribly, terribly messed up. Anybody in here that's been really messed up, or you think you messed up now, you couldn't have been as messed up as I was. And so I was kind of embarrassed, but I had a workman working in my house about three years ago, and he said, did the doctor, you tell the doctor what uh, became of you? And I said, no. Uh, and, the, and the workman was someone, you know, he was just like a good old country boy, and he was trying to figure out what I did for a living, and, and so I showed him the video to show him where I came from. And, uh, and he said, did you tell the doctor? Did you tell the doctor? No, I haven't. You gotta do it, you gotta do it now. And that day, I called the clinic, left a message, and this doctor uh, case called me back. And we had a conversation, and he said he remembered me, and that he always wondered what happened to me. And then he and his wife invited me to, they live in Medina, Ohio, invited me to Medina, and uh, I visited with them, and I was still really embarrassed. And his wife was so generous. She sent him to the airport by himself in case we want to talk about something. But um, <laughs> I, it, it was really uncomfortable, but this past week, last week, I was in Ashland, Ohio, and, uh, and, and I stayed, Dr. Case and his wife, they picked me up from the airport, I stayed at their home, and they went to Ashland University to uh, hear me speak. And their uh, son and daughter and daughter-in-law, they all uh, came, daughter-in-law to be. Uh, but what he didn't know was that I was gonna play that video and I was gonna recognize him. And, uh, and I did that. And I think he was a little bit embarrassed, but his kids thought it was great. And his son said, I knew you were gonna do that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, he was instrumental in my life, and the African orderly, he got to know the story more because when I w was on the faculty of Princeton, I looked him up, and so he knew, you know, that I had continued with my career and my life. But those were people that God put in my life, and I would say that God used a lot of people in my life, and they were not all cr Christian believers, and I was more of a one God, many paths, always spiritual, always felt that there was something I was supposed to do in my life, but not knowing exactly what it was. And, uh, and I've had you know, quite a journey, and I believe that going to Princeton, you know, again, I didn't set out to become a university professor. It's a long story about how I got steered into that track, but I ended up getting a signing bonus for Princeton, and every school uh, tried to, that tried to hire me offered me a signing bonus. I was a hot shot. After I got tenure, God just yanked a rug off one of my feet because I was always miserable, even when I was winning national prizes. And I won the highest prize a political scientist can win, and I was still miserable. And um, it, that sent me on this journey, a spiritual journey, that culminated with my having a Christian conversion experience, and God lifted off of me my fear of public speaking. It was gone like the snap of a finger that I didn't have to clutch the lectern or write out everything uh, that I was going to say. And, uh, and God impressed on my mind that he had given me a message bigger than me and that all I had to do was please him. And when I was afraid to speak, it was because I'd make a mistake or I sound funny because I'm Southern and just all of these terrible things that I imagined and that people would laugh at me. Once I knew I only had to please God, I was free to say and do whatever I needed to do. And so then uh, I have been, you know, bold and I started doing national media. And I'm out there in this battle, not for myself, but because I believe that God has called me, that he's given me a message and he's told me not to worry about the consequences. And um, I went from being a hot shot to being a pariah. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, you know, and and I don't know, but it, it's been quite a journey, but God has provided for me every step of the way. And 2017, I left academia, I took early retirement. And if that had been a 
For one thing, being a professor is a great gig, and that's what it is. And, you know, there's no reason uh, to leave it unless it's uncomfortable. And I believe that even the timing of my leaving was God because it has given me so many opportunities to reach people that I would never reach. Like in the classroom, you know, you reach 35, 40, maybe 80 people, maybe 100 uh, a, a year, maybe 200. But I've been able to reach millions through avenues that God has opened up. And I would not have been able to do that if I had just stayed limited on one campus, waiting for the students that came through my classroom. Uh, so I see uh, God's hand in that. I see um, just, you know, the open and closed doors. And I'm truly, uh, you know, learning how to trust God with the things that I don't quite understand. And with this critical race theory, I was on the four, I'm not bragging now. <laughs> But I was actually on the forefront in that, before I left Vanderbilt, for the last four years or so, I was teaching a class uh, uh, on political culture and was focused on the impact of communism on American political thought. And so we were rereading com communist literature and other literatures and uh, just various things. And, and I, I've always believed in, you know, more than one side. And so when I presented, um, liberal stuff, it was balanced with conservative and vice versa, if I showed, uh, and I did show that Curtis Bower's film, Grinding America Dan, but I showed it uh, uh, with, uh, uh, what's the guy, um, Mo the Moore guy? Uh, Michael Moore. Michael Moore. I show, if I showed something very liberal, I showed something uh, uh, very conservative, and so they got exposed to more than one side. And, uh, and I got very interested in Marxism and critical race theory, and I realized that um, you know, all the years I was at Princeton, and when I was in graduate school, you had Marxist professors, and you, know, they, you knew who they were, you took their classes if you wanted to, but, and there was all this talk about critical theory and postmodernism and deconstructionism and everything, action in the philosophy department. I had no idea how it was going, going to impact our lives. And I was not paying enough attention. I was a congressional scholar. That was how I was tenured. I, I mean, I was all about Congress and American politics. I was not paying attention. And by the time I started paying attention, they had gained so much power. And with the political correctness, the microaggressions, the safe spaces, the trigger warnings, um, the cultural appropriations, and all of that nonsense that we had on college campuses, I mean, it. It went from you know being in one part of the university to affecting every field in the university, and then it really took over the education departments, and that's why you see it uh, going to K-12 education, and um, affirmative action you know has been the law of the land since the early 1970s, and it was really started in the mid 1960s, shortly after the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, but uh, what is taking place now is another layer on top of affirmative action that is different. And if you uh, understand postmodernism, and there's a book that I would recommend by Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay called Cynical Theories that connects the postmodernism to critical theory and to Marxism. And then it has a closing section that advises people on how to fight back against it. And these two scholars are not um, conservatives. There's, they are classical liberals who are very worried about America and the fact that classical liberals have become casualties of critical theory. And they, are, they fear for America. But um, all of these things you know, have taken place that now you have critical theory in the K uh, through 12 public schools, private schools. And one of the things that uh, is really disheartening is that it's in our churches. Uh, almost all of our churches. And the Southern Baptists, you know, have been the most conservative de denomination. I would argue that the uh, Southern Baptists are at the point of collapse, just like other denominations. And that a lot of people, um, some people don't understand what's taking place. And if I hear the Southern Baptists apologize for slavery one more time, I'm gonna scream. If they apologize for their existence one more time because 
they have been apologizing since the 1960s and maybe it was the 50s. All I know is that they constantly issue apologies. I'm, I'm ready now for someone to stand up and accept the apology and, and extend some forgiveness. To extend some forgiveness uh, because Jesus died on the cross for our past, present, and future sins. Racism is a sin problem. And so even if you are racist or were racist and your ancestors were racist, if you confess that, if you ask for forgiveness, you don't have to do it every day. Um, you know, you're supposed to confess it, receive uh, the, the forgiveness that comes through Jesus, and turn away from it. Uh, but this whole thing of confessing every other day, that's not biblical. And uh, I found that with the uh, Southern Baptists, a lot of times, you know, the social justice, social justice, you know, comes out of the postmodernism and um, capital social justice and uh, the critical theory, and it's not the same as biblical justice. Like, uh, God is a God of justice, and if you look at biblical justice, it's not the same as um, what is being talked about today. And so with the political left, they've changed the meaning of words. When they talk about equity, educational equity, they're not talking about equal opportunity, creating an environment that will bring the best out of everyone so everyone can thrive. They're talking about equal uh, outcomes, equal op outcomes to the point that they would remove classes for gifted and talented students, uh, classes, uh, advanced placement classes, and that hurts racial and ethnic minorities as much as anyone is because there are always racial and ethnic minorities, minorities that qualified for those classes or in those classes and got the advantages. Uh, if you take them out of the public schools, it's gonna affect everyone's child. And so that's a problem, that's a serious problem. And um, they are, you know, they're against a colorblind society because they don't believe that can happen. They argue that racism is permanent. And if racism is permanent, you know, we might as well just pack up our bags and go home. It's nothing we can do about it. Uh, but they argue that racism is permanent. And the whole thing about critical race theory is that it's a racist theory. It is a white supremacist theory because it argues that white people have a property interest in their whiteness and that everything is structured by white people. They control all the power. Everything is about them and that they are the only one that can liberate uh, you know, racial and ethnic minorities, that everything is dependent on white people. That takes away the agency of racial and ethnic minorities the whole idea of personal responsibility, the whole idea that what you do matters. Like, I made hard decisions when I was studying and, and, and trying to get my degree as quickly as possible so I could get a job. I had a goal. Uh, I made decisions to do this and not do that. Well, according to the message that we send young people, it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, the, because racism is so pervasive and so systemic uh, that it's the racism that controls everything. And so for white people, you know, they're told that they have to divest themselves of their whiteness. And just think about that. Imagine if you went and told a black person they need to divest themselves of their blackness. If you told me that, I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so to divest themselves of their whiteness, white people, the first thing they're supposed to do, and some of them do, they get down on their knee and they confess. They confess uh, that they are racist, their ancestors are racist, and everything they have is undeserved. And, uh, and so then the next step they're supposed to do is to become consciously anti-racist. And by becoming consciously anti-racist, they're supposed to challenge racism wherever they see it. And so they're supposed to challenge other whites. And I can remember, like this was a few years ago when I was still at the university, a professor writing an article telling uh, students that they should go home for Thanksgiving and challenge their grandparents and uh, their parents when they engage in racist uh, language and, and racism. And so, you know, at the time they wasn't calling it anti-racism, but now I understand what they were doing. But they were telling, uh, you know, young people to go home and challenge their parents. And you think about you know, the disrespect and the indoctrination that is taking place and has taken place. And so I taught for 28 years, and I can tell you that the last years that I taught, I had so many young people that came in, and they had the answers 
to all the great questions of the world. They had it all solved. They had it all worked out. And uh, you couldn't tell them anything. I mean, it was they were so indoctrinated that they could regurgitate all the politically correct answers to all the big issues in the world. And when they want a safe space, they want insulation from any professor that's going to expose them to divergent ideas that's going to make them think. Because if you think, it causes discomfort. And like part of the growing process and the educational process is that you get exposed to different divergent ideas and it creates a friction and you have to grapple and you have to figure things out and you have to seek truth. I mean, that's, you know, we're sort of wired to seek truth, but if you've been indoctrinated, and, and so these kids started coming in, you know, the, the last few years I was teaching, fully indoctrinated. Now they want to start at K-12, and they want to start teaching uh, first graders about whiteness, uh, and there are the arguments that babies are racist uh, by uh, three months, three to six months that babies are racist. And um, you have to realize this is somebody's research. And in academia, you get rewarded for your ideas. And the more bizarre your ideas, the greater the reward. Um, and um, so I think the way this research, and I haven't read the study, is that the babies favor uh, certain faces. And I assume that little white babies favorite white faces and little black babies favorite black faces. Uh, could that have something to do with who's changing my diaper and feeding me every day? <laughs> and so uh, with social engineering, there's no problem that human ingenuity can't solve, because these are secular humanists. They don't believe in God. Uh, they don't believe in the one race, uh, the human race. And so they want to teach children to, uh, to distinguish race, to, be, to become racist. They want to teach children to be racist because naturally, and I, I, I do believe you all that said, I grew up not seeing color. You know, I grew up, you know, eating at my black friend's house, and we ate at each other's houses. We shared the same beds, and we didn't see color. Well, that's racist, and that's just your white privilege and your white fragility talking. That's what the political left would say. But I do believe that there are people that did not see race. And you know, they're just not focused on race. Well, they're trying to teach our children. Even Sesame Street is trying to expose people, kids, to a training where they will see people's color. And they are you know, pretty much teaching them that black people are disadvantaged. And that's stereotyping. It's the worst kind of stereotyping. And um, it's like, like, what could possibly go wrong? I can think of so much can go wrong. Like, if I'm in a, a class uh, as a little kid, and I might be the only black, or I might be the only white, and I've been taught to see race, and somebody that's a member of the other group keeps punching me. I'm not going to see that, you know, Billy is punching me, and I might see that Billy, you know, the black kid, or Billy the white kid is punching me and make inferences about his whole group. I'm going to be afraid of everyone that looks like Billy because I've been taught to see race. And I think that's what we will end up with if we focus on teaching our kids, you know, starting with Sesame Street and with Nickelodeon and all of these things to see race. And that is what is taking place in our society. And the other thing that's deeply disturbing is the bullying and the shaming. And there's some videos that have been shown to middle class students that uh, at one time they were just shown to college students. Uh, and it's supposed to sensitize people to race, but it's in a very shocking kind of way. And Watching it as a black person, watching these animated uh, videos, I would just give up. I mean, I don't think I would get out of bed because it's teaching that there's so many roadblocks for you because of the color of your skin that it doesn't matter what you do. And with whites, it's all about white guilt, white privilege, white advantages. I can tell you when I was growing up in rural Virginia and I was working those dead-end jobs, I worked in a garment factory, I worked in nursing homes, I sold garments, and sold things from door to door. I often worked alongside white, poor whites, and they were as happy as I was to get that 10 to 25 cents an hour raise. And they had children, they had dreams for their children too. And the real America, I don't think the real America has a race problem. I think our leaders have a race problem. And I think that uh, they are using critical race theory, diversity, equity, and inclusion to divide us. And if you actually look at the results, from places where they have done the training, people come out more hostile towards the other group than before. 
It makes racism where racism didn't exist before. It's something that needs to be stopped. Um, and um, I have a one minute uh, video of uh, a company that I started. This is really awkward because I'm gonna try to finish enough time to, to let you ask a question so that people can leave. But I'm gonna play this one minute video and then talk a little bit about how that came to be. It's a new company that I incorporated last fall. And the idea was birthed last summer during the riots. Demands for political correctness and mandatory race and gender diversity training have placed onerous burdens on businesses, churches, and nonprofits. Learn how to improve relations by educating your team with principle-based training that brings people together rather than driving wedges between them. Unity Training Solutions helps your organization build strong teams by respecting and harnessing individual talent, achieving your goals by providing viable alternatives to the divisive and counterproductive critical race and gender theories is our mission. Our expert facilitators and consultants bring greater harmony to workplaces and educational institutions by respecting everyone's civil rights and equality under the law. We encourage Americans to rediscover and re-embrace our national motto, E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. A few of our core values and principles include no hidden agendas, respecting the differences of others. Our citizens share more similarities than differences and trusting in the traditional principles of hard work, integrity, and accountability. Our seminars are geared towards your organization, educational, business, corporate, as well as churches and nonprofits. Want to know more about how to strengthen your team? Knowledge is power. You can learn more about Unity Training Solutions at unitytrainingsolutions.com. And the idea for Unity Training is one of those middle of the night things. I got up and I did what any entrepreneurial spirit person would do. I went and tried to purchase the do domain name, unitytraining.com, and it was gone. And I like Unity Training Solutions better. And so uh, I purchased that. I launched uh, the company in November, and we expect to start doing training in the fall when we get our training materials together. And I've been going out talking to some companies about it. But uh, I'm doing it um, and encouraging other people to do the same that we cannot allow the political left to dominate that space. Because right now, if you're a conservative business person, you're a church, and you understand that diversity, equity, and inclusion training as being done is steeped in critical theory and it's dividing people, if you're being forced to do it, you don't have an alternative, and we want to have alternatives. So that is that. And um, there are lots of things you know, that I wish I had time to talk about. Uh, with critical race theory and the church, like it is a different, it's a different gospel. It redefines the gospel. It redefines the moral life about what is truth because it rejects uh, what we know about truth. It rejects uh, biblical truth. It redefines identity. Our identity is supposed to be in Christ. All of us, regardless of our race and ethnicity, the identity is supposed to be in Christ. And um, these are things that. Um, it's, it's not being, uh, it's not a part of uh, what is being fostered on many religious organizations. And so I think that if it's coming into your church under the guise of social justice, it's very important, you know, to stand up to it, go back to the Bible, go back to forgiveness, go back to what Jesus said, by their love, he, uh, they should know us. And he created from one man, all nations of men, and uh, I think that just like with the civil rights movement, that was a movement where everyone locked arms and we fought together. We have to do that again because this is our new civil rights uh, area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You, you can be seated. Uh, it's 1.15. If anyone has to run off to their job, they can. Otherwise, I'm going to give 15 minutes for question and answer. But if you need to uh, slip out, 
I understand. Yes. Uh, the title of the book is Cynical Theories, and it's by Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay. Cynical Theories. Yes. First, I met you at the Republican National Convention in Prayer Room in September. Okay. That was special. On the Unity Solutions, will you be sharing that information like um, Video or in person? And uh, how can we where it's going to be several ways. Uh, I'm working with a businessman to create uh, videos where people can, you know, have a video course. But uh, this one day seminars is that I would travel to a location with one of the facilitators. There's a, a pastor that's involved, and if we were doing a church or a religious organization, he would be my co teacher. I'm going to present the civil rights history and the law and that part of it because that's important. And I, I'm not opposed to diversity. God is a God of diversity. Look at nature. Diversity is everywhere. So it's not a, against diversity. It's against the way that it's being done. And so uh, I would be available for some of the in-person training, but it's going to be a combination of videos. And, and, uh, and I've gone to some businesses to explain uh, the program and how it's going to work. And uh, I'm anticipating two books. One, Critical Race Theory, a guide uh, for the perplexed that will be released by July. And then another one that makes the case for critical <coughs> theory and a training manual. And then I do encourage other people that have ideas to compete in this space because the more the merrier. It, you know, this is an idea, but we need uh, conservative Judeo-Christian values people that are principled to compete in this space. And you don't compete by saying there's no such thing as racism. Racism is real, and it c includes all different groups. Any group is capable of being racist against another. It's always sin from the Christian perspective. How do we support or promote your work, or promote your work like with churches and businesses? Uh, well, the I think that um, the, the book, uh, the Critical Race Theory book, is going to be the first one published. And so that will probably be in July. And just by word of mouth, mouth sending people uh, to the website. And I do have a, a, a nonprofit. I have a 501c3 uh, called Be the People Project. And, uh, and I have a television show called Conversations with Dr. Carol Swain that's on the Binge TV network. And anyone that has one of, any one of 300 apps on smart TVs can go to the Binge TV network and watch those episodes. And there's been about 34 of those uh, episodes produced in a television studio. And I have a corporate sponsor. And um, I have one sponsor, but I would love to have other businesses that's trying to reach a national audience. And I don't feel called uh, to the uh, uh, Christian world in the sense that I believe God has called me to the world. And so my program is not something that I've ever wanted to be on Christian TV. I bring in guests and we talk about our conservative values and principles and people start praising God and talk about their faith, but it's not planned. And, um, and that, I believe, is how I have been led to present what I do. And then I you know, do the TV and I have, um, actually, if we can't, the 1776 uh, Project Commission Report I think I have 10 books now that are either edited or single authored. And so you can always uh, purchase a book, um, the Be the People book. There's one abduction, how liberalism steals the hearts and minds of our children. So there's any number of ways that people can be supported. But this is really about Eagle Forum and my being invited here. And you know, I really encourage all of you all, if you're not a member, sign up. And if you can donate to support that work, donate to support that work. And it's very important, you know, to get young people involved and to carry forth their mission. And, and I support Eagle Forum. I also support us other conservative organizations like PragerU, um, Turning Point USA, Blexit, that was started by Candace Owens, uh, the, the Clara Luce Booth Organization for Young Women. And so all of these conservative groups, like we are working for the same thing. And uh, we just have to keep doing the part that God has called us to do because everyone's mission is a little bit different. And with Eagle Forum, you know, they are really great with public policy. And uh, there is a handout about critical race theory that's excellent. Uh, I think, um, you know,
you know, I don't, I'm, I'm supposed to be modest, right? Okay, I'm modest. Um, I, I, I'm the only person I heard, you know, on television and repeating over and over that critical race theory was a violation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that covers all people, whites, blacks, every race, and the Equal Protection Clause. And now more people are saying it, and this pamphlet by Ecoform, that's one of the things that it points out. And I mean, that's huge. And if you think about the government subsidizing critical race theory, they're subsidizing something that's against the Constitution, against the civil rights laws. Uh, lawsuits have to be filed, they need to be filed. And in, uh, there are 14 states where the legislators have either filed already and passed laws, or they have uh, initiatives uh, banning critical race theory because it is a violation of civil rights laws in the Constitution. It's banning discrimination on the basis of race or gender. It's banning discrimination. And, uh, and it's solid. Discrimination in public institutions, we should not be subsidizing that. And if you don't have that already in Alabama, you need it because we need a critical mass. And hopefully at least all the red states will pass legislation because it is anti-American to shame and bully people because of the color of their skin. And it doesn't change because the person is white. And um, I think that we have to say that. And if racial and ethnic minorities need to take the lead because white people lost their voice, then we need to take the lead. But we need to lock arms the same way we did during the civil rights movement and fight. Because this is really a fight for America and everything we've held dear. Okay. Yeah. This group is telling in some way that here, meaning mostly white, few blacks, uh, most of the right. events I attend that may have some conservative event, uh, bent that look like this. So many people in this community know your name, know about your work. What's going on as you travel throughout the country? In, in regards to life. Yeah, that's a good question, and uh, thank you for asking it. A lot's going on. For one thing, when I ran for mayor of Nashville, um, I did something, you know, that it wasn't so popular with Republicans. I set up my uh, office in the black community, and some of that had to do with what I could afford, but a lot of it had to do with me wanting to connect with the people, and uh, I walked all the door to door. Uh, in the community, uh, knocking on the doors of all the black businesses, introducing myself. And I actually ended up increasing my support in the black community. And I debated, you know, at black churches and various places. And I had so many people that supported me. And that when I lost, uh, and part of my losing was because uh, there were Republicans that endorsed and supported my uh, opponent. And you know, I'm not going to say they supported him because he was white. He was very wealthy. His father had been a governor. His brother was a member of Congress. Uh, he had lots of money. He had lots of money, but they believed that no Republican could win. And so as that defeatist attitude, they believed that it was impossible. I came in uh, number two in the first election. They, uh, the first election, I had more Republican support. The second election, I came in number three. But I was outspent like six to one and you know, four to one. Um, but I did really well, uh, better than anyone expected, and I got more Democrat support than anyone ever expected, and that had to do with my showing up. I have recently um, uh, was signed a contract with Blexit, and Blexit is the organization that was started by Candace Owens, and it has to do with black exit you know, from the Democratic Party, but it's bigger than that, because they're focused on uh, education, they are uh, focused on Christian values and principles. And the people that recruited me for the show Against the Odds were young blacks all under uh, 30. In fact, the youngest person working on my show, the creative person, is 19. And uh, they named the show Against the Odds. And they want me to, to, for 15 to 30 minutes to talk about anything I want to talk about. But they say, we want your show to be about faith and culture. And I went to a Blexit conference in Chattanooga 
a few weeks ago, and the room was packed with black people. Uh, white people were a minority, but white people were there. And I am very encouraged by the young people of all different races and ethnicities who are truly woke. And I, I mean, that's what woke means. We in this room, we are woke. Those other people are deceived in sleep. The, uh, they're not woke. Yes. Dr. Swain, we know uh, Governor DeSantis has banned critical race theory in Florida. Is there any chance you can get in front of the Governor's Association when they meet and give them, you know, your thoughts on critical race theory? I'm not going to make it. Well, the question was, uh, Governor DeSantis has banned critical race theory, and President Trump, before he left office, uh, he banned it in, by federal agencies. Uh, I'm not bragging, but <laughs> when I spoke at the Council on National Policy in August uh, of last year, I criticized critical race theory and what was taking place when I talked about us needing to compete in that space. And it was probably like a week or so after that when the first directive came out about um, not funding critical race theory, uh, those diversity trainers. And then maybe two weeks after that was when the president did an executive order saying that federal agencies would not cover critical race theory and that it was uh, against, well, pretty much against um, them, <laughs> our values and principles. It was discriminatory. and. Um, I think that it is the that is true, and it remains true today. And um, but so she asked me, would I get in front of the Governors Association? Only if some of you all who have more clout than I do make it happen, because I'm not chasing down opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm concerned about our young people in the military academies. Right. But well, they've been brainwashed, just like our young kids in seminaries and everywhere else. And I know that um, there's some member of Congress, maybe a couple of them, that have proposed legislation not to have critical theory in the military. And if you've seen that new ad about the CIA, where this woman is, you know, she's cis uh, gender and she's all of these things, uh, uh, they have they're weakening our nation by pushing an agenda that's not about our strength. It's about social engineering, and it's very dangerous. And uh, you know, when I came through, and when most, you know, whether you're black or white or, or whatever, you know, you wanted equal opportunity. You wanted non-discrimination. You just wanted people to get out of the way, let you show what you could do. That's not what it's about anymore. It's about equal opportunity. There's less emphasis on whether people are really qualified, and that's very dangerous. Yes. Um, I was going to piggyback on that. My husband is a colonel in the military, and so um, they are still pushing, um, you know, the critical race theory and everything like that. And for a lot of them, the training is just like in one ear out the other. You know, it, I, I think it's a terrible thing, thing what they're doing, and and that it, and it is so racist on its face because it's actually saying that white people have all the power, that only white people can liberate racial and ethnic minorities. White people need to divest themselves of their skin color. Uh, I don't know how you do that, but divest themselves of it. And, uh, and then they're also saying that racism is permanent, that no matter what you do, and it's not an out. Like if you give them everything they want, you give everyone reparations, you give them everything they want, they can still say that uh, any uh, inequities it is still because of white racism because at the end of the day success has a lot to do with your attitude how hard you work and uh, you know what you believe about the world and what they're doing is indoctrinating a lot of racial and ethnic minorities to believe that the ra world is just against them and police against them and no matter what they do uh, it doesn't make a difference so it's white people stripping racial and ethnic minorities of any type of agency and control over their own lives, if they would actually uh, you know, slow down long enough to think about what they argue, they would realize that it's the worst form of racism. And so it's one, one last question, and I will let you go. There was a hand over there. Oh, I got to take this young man. And then, <laughs> yes? Um, I want to commend you and your peers on your work on the 
1776 Commission and the work that you did with that because it's exceptional. It ought to be a preface in every history book around this nation, and my fear is that it's going to become a relic because um, when the current administration came into office, they obviously sought to really diminish it. How do we get that? Well, how do we get that out there, and how do we piggyback off the good work that you all did? to make sure that that becomes the narrative of history and how you can use that to combat 1619 Project. We are overcomers. We have the American spirit, and it, it would take more than the stroke of a pen to eliminate an idea like the 1776 Commission. So we did not go out of business. We're very much in business, and we published a book uh, a few weeks ago that has uh, an introduction. It has uh, end notes, because the report itself didn't have end notes. And so it has end notes, and we are meeting as a commission the end of this month with other stakeholders. And so we're not going away. And I think that um, uh, what we did was important. And we did it in a short period of time because we knew that we were going to be eliminated, most likely. I was hoping we wouldn't, but we were uh, eliminated. But thank you uh, for commending uh, our work. And there was one hand over there, and then uh, you, I really do have to let you go. Just the Republicans. <laughs> refuse to believe that Democrats are smarter than Republicans. <laughs> but we always seem to be, uh, what, a, 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 what, a day late and a dollar short? <laughs> and we always playing catch up. And I think that we have too many Republicans that want to be loved, and they, they are afraid to speak up. And if you are worried about being called a racist, I would like to put your mind to rest if you're white, you're going to be called a racist no matter what you do. And so you are a racist, accept it, and then operate on principle. And I think with a lot of Republicans is that if you have core principles, you don't have to figure out what to do uh, on January 6th after uh, you know the, the little riot. If you have a principled position, you operate on that principle. And I think that we need uh, new leaders, but we need people that don't want to go to Congress or city council or wherever they're going to stay, that are willing to make hard decisions even if, if it costs them their position because they're statesmen, they're stateswomen. And so we need people that love our nation more than they love themselves and their jobs. Thank you. We want, we want you to remember us. We'll All certainly right. remember you after right. that wonderful presentation. <laughs> well, thank so you so much. Take a look in there now, okay. All right. pull it out, <laughs> and we'll tell everybody what it is because we don't want to leave people guessing. <laughs> it is oh, a patriot beautiful. pen, okay. and it has an eagle and a flag, and it says, it God bless beautiful. America. Thank you. And it's made from wood. Thank you so wood much. Wood Yes, thank you. Thank you. We love it, We appreciate it so much. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I can't begin to thank uh, those who put this together, and including our talented and, and gracious and uh, no telling what height she'll, she'll, uh, she'll reach, 6th District Chairman Stephanie Smith. We are, we are planning, uh, in the 6th District in particular, to start small groups so that we will have a group in every state legislative district in this area and in the state. Now, if we have that, you'll see the best state in the nation. We're, we're, we're close now, but we, we got a way to go. And it takes grassroots participation, and that is you. That is, uh, Carol said that she has a message. She saw that she had a message bigger than 
she, we have that same message. And together we can give it a message of freedom and liberty, which must be, must be maintained. And we can reach, she, she's reached 70 million with her videos. We don't have to reach that many. We just have to reach those who represent us in our own communities, in their own state, and in our nation. It can be done. Now, we have for you uh, the 1776 report, which she mentioned. This is the copy of the original, if you'd like to pick one of these up. <clears throat> and the Truth Brochure, which was drafted by uh, Pat Ellis, one of our board members, and um, um, display the display here is by uh, one of our volunteers who's obviously also very talented. So pick those up and use them to spread the word. And thank you. Yes. Membership. Membership, absolutely. There are membership cards back there. Also, you can go online. Thank you to our Attorney General for being here, to Senator Roberts, to Representative Mooney. Thank you to my pastor, Jim Cooley, for hosting us. And thank you, every single one of you. God bless America.